Welcome to the First Mentor Podcast. Here, you will hear us talk about a variety of topics for the entire family that will hopefully spark a discussion, create a new curiosity, or simply teach you something new. The goal is to inspire you to learn life skills and soft skills not taught in school and prepare you to live an extraordinary life. Come on and spend some time with us on your commute to school or anytime you're free. Hello, mentees and parents of mentees. Welcome to our show. This is your host and mentor, Vanessa Yang. And thank you for joining us for episode 29 of the First Mentor Podcast. And today we'll be speaking with Carolyn Mall, and she's a professional life coach and wellness advocate with over 20 years of experience. And she holds a master's degree in holistic nutrition and many other certifications. And she's also an expert on shifting your mindset to leverage the power of positive thinking and healthy living. So you're in for a treat, right? Because Carolyn also authored books, including one that we're going to be covering today, which is Wealth, Affirmations for Abundance. So I'm really excited to start our discussions and at the end, don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends and family. And if you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you can comment what you like about it on iTunes or Apple Podcast. And without further ado, let's get started. And today we have a special guest on our podcast, and I would like to welcome Carolyn Mall to the show. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? Hi, Vanessa. I'm so great. How are you doing today? Great. I really appreciate you, you know, come on this podcast because you've helped me before when we met several years ago and I felt like it was by the universe because I was looking for something and there you sat next to me at a women's conference, right? <laughs> uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And in overall, what I've noticed about you throughout our time that I've known you, you just have such a positive, vibrant, lively energy with you, right? Everywhere you go. And it's really perfect for your profession as a health coach, life coach, what have you. So to catch our listeners up just a little bit, would you mind sharing more about your background and how you got started in the coaching profession? Absolutely. When I grew up in Ohio, I didn't know anything about coaching except that I played sports in high school, a junior high and high school, all, all the seasons, all the sports. And I came to really, really respect my coaches. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they were teaching me things that were applicable to my life, like not only on the basketball court, but also, <laughs> you know, at home and, yeah. and everywhere else I went. And, and I really had a lot of great mentors growing up and I'm lucky for that, but also I feel like I was open to that. When I left Ohio, I moved to Arizona. I've moved a lot of different places in my life. Yes. And that's part of like owning who I am, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of wanderlust. And as a life coach, I think it's important to be able to own the parts of you that maybe other people don't understand or maybe look down at or having to constantly be in movement is something that defines me. And I'm not really afraid to admit that anymore. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, you know who you are by now. I know who I am by now. And, and also, you know, my kids now are 22 and 18. I had amazing birth experiences with both of them. I jokingly say I'm the queen of transformation, but yeah. not really. Because <laughs> it's there's always the next you and there's always the next place and, and people can evolve. You can change. You can decide one day that you're going to do something different. Yes. And, it's and, o and it is A-okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And how did you start it? How did you enter the industry of coaching? I was doing too many things. Yeah. I was leading the, the town's youth soccer program. I had my art in a gallery. I oh, wow. was racing in triathlons. Like, and finally, I just got to the point where I said, you know what, Carolyn, like do one thing and do it well. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate though to all those interests in your life. <laughs> right. Because you, I'm a yes person. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. Like when you're a yes person, mm -hmm. you just say yes to everything that comes along. Yeah. And sometimes to your detriment. <laughs> yes, that's true. It could be exhausting. Right. And so I got to that point. 
at about, you know, like 2003. So I decided, I, I really took a good look at things. And I said, you know, what is really my passion? Like, what is really what lights me up? Mm -hmm. And this was the first step to basically like what I would call the life coaching like path that I've been on is I had to do it for myself. Great. So I decided to go back to school and I got a master's degree in holistic nutrition. Oh, yes. I love that. You know, I got a personal trainer certificate. I got two yoga certificate. Like basically I went into the health and wellness field Mm -hmm. head first. Yeah. And that's how I started my first business. I was doing in-home personal training for people because my, my kids were little and they were in elementary school. And if they had a cold, I had to, you know, yeah. be flexible. Mm-hmm. So that's when I started my first business in health and wellness coaching, seriously, just focusing on nutrition and fitness. However, <laughs> during the, when I first started doing that, like probably, you know, six months into it, I realized that what I really wanted to talk to people about is why they weren't doing what they said they were going to do. Mm, yes. Especially with health and fitness. We all have great new year's resolutions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and as a personal trainer, you know, you show up, you, you can clearly see what the problem is. You can clearly like tell people what to do to fix the problem. And then you come back the next week and nothing's changed. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> it really led me to think about the aspects of human behavior that keep people stuck or mm-hmm. inspire them to change. Yes, so true. So true. And so that's that's how it all kind of started. And like I said, that was in so that was in 2006 when I started my first business. Then in 2010, I moved to New Hampshire with mm-hmm. my kids. I got divorced because that was not a good thing for me at the time. Yeah. And uh, we moved to New Hampshire to be my my dad and my family. And then I worked in primarily like the corporate world of wellness coaching. Oh, okay. So that gave me another flavor of things. Mm -hmm. And then after about six years there, my son had graduated from high school and my daughter was just about to go into high school. You probably are catching on by now that I made my kids move a lot, (laughs) (laughs) but I promised my son I would get him through one high school in one town. And I did that. And I promised my daughter the exact same thing. And she was like, well, why don't we move to California? Ah. Like, I want to go to high school in California. I was like, well, all right, California is. So we moved to Ventura. (laughs) Oh, wow. Upon her request, basically. Basically, because, you know, we were all pretty much done with New England. Like, Mm -hmm. it was a great ride. I was so grateful to be near my dad. We lived in a beautiful home in a beautiful town. Like it was surrounded by vineyards and farmlands. Like it was very idyllic, Yeah, but it's New Hampshire and it's like the country. And my kids are like, wait, what are we supposed to do? (laughs) (laughs) So we ended up moving to Ventura and I put her through one high school in one town. Mm -hmm. And she chose a school that had a, a very strong German program because she wanted to do the study abroad program. She oh, wanted to go to Germany. Good for her. And guess what? She did. She did. Mm-hmm. That is so great. I actually, when I grew up, I can relate to your kids. My parents moved around in Germany <laughs> quite a lot. So I moved around with them, like to different mm-hmm. towns. Every time my dad changed his job, it made me, I, in a way, the person I am, which is more outgoing easier to make friends. So it's not all bad. I mean, yes, I lost some along the way, of course, but it just made me more resilient and adaptive, I would say. And at the end of the day, they are so grateful for the experiences that they've had. Right. Because now they see the contrast to their peers who haven't had any of those experiences. So true. Yeah. It takes a certain amount of maturity, you know, to be able to learn the lessons that were hard. (laughs) That's so true. And I want to actually help our listeners define it a little bit more, right? For those who've never really had a life coach before, like you said, maybe they were in high school, middle school, or even college and did sports. So they know what a coach is from an athletic perspective, but a life coach, can you explain a little bit how you would define it and how do life coaches support an individual? Sure. On the outset, I would love everyone to know that my oldest client right now is 73 Mm. And my youngest is 17. Oh, wow. It's big range, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. 
I don't prescribe medication. Like mm-hmm. there is definitely a, a scope of practice that I feel very strongly about adhering to. Mm-hmm. But a life coach is basically someone who gives you the space, like a safe space to be able to explore options in your life. Mm-hmm. Like if something's not working in your life, I can be your sounding board, your confidential sounding board to be able to discuss if, is this a repeating pattern? What is, what is happening here? Mm-hmm. Or say you're at a point where you just feel really stuck. Like you don't know what to do next. You just know that you're constantly unhappy. Mm-hmm. People are not supposed to be constantly unhappy. Yeah, they're not. They're not <laughs> absolutely not. And so when that keeps happening, you have to know that something is amiss. And so a life coach is basically someone who can help guide you through transitions in your life where you know you want to make a change, you are expecting to make a change, you need to make a change. Yes. But either A, you don't know how to start, or B, you need someone to be held accountable to. And Uh to be quite honest, the accountability factor is where it's at. I think so. I think so. Because they know they're going to meet with you, right? If it's, I don't know if it's mm-hmm. weekly or bi-weekly, they're like, uh-oh, meeting with Carolyn is coming up. She said I should do X, Y, Z, and I haven't done mm-hmm. this yet. <laughs> yep. And I will hold your feet to the fire. You know what I mean? I think it's really helpful to have somebody, like you said, a, a sounding board, because many times you go through life and the, especially as you're growing up, there's just so many questions you have, right? Mm. What do I do? What do I like? What do I want to be? I'm not happy, but I don't know what else is out there. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they just don't want to talk to their parents or friends too much because it's more personal. Yeah. Have you? So it's like a neutral third party, but somebody who understands you and really listens to you and gives you guidance at, at the same time. One of the things that I'm actually good at that I was gifted with that didn't like, I didn't practice it is, is intuition, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're talking to me about your stuff, my brain is just making all kinds of connections and thinking about things that maybe yours didn't, you know what I mean? Like, because you're too close to it. Yeah. (laughs) And it's, and it's also easy for me to listen to someone talk and intuitively understand like, okay, I I'm hearing what is holding them back. Like, now, how do I have that conversation with them tactfully in order to get them to understand that? Actually, you do have this gift because we've both talked before. You've helped me, right? At one point in my life too. You, you're right. I was saying certain things and I remember you were like, well, have you thought about that? And, and, <laughs> and to me, it was like, oh, actually I haven't. That's actually a really good point. So you do have really great intuition and connect the dots. So I can definitely attest to that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and you know what? It's, it's fun for me. I don't take people's problems on, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like water off a duck's back because you can't be in this profession and like be thinking about your clients at two in the morning. Like, oh my gosh, we're in. That won't be healthy for you. (laughs) No. (laughs) The amount of accountability really, really, really depends on the person. And I have one person who I have forced them to text me every single day Mm. by the end of the day and to give me a certain, a certain piece of information. You know, that person needs Uh that. It is no skin off my back to receive a text, yeah. but it's everything to them to get my thumbs up on it. That is so true. I think the accountability part is absolutely important because when you, when you think about it, especially in health and wealth, we all know what we need to do. <laughs> the question is, why don't we do it? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, Tony Robbins, and there's so many people out there in the, in the self-help industry, yeah. will tell you that people are motivated by either pain or pleasure. Right. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. And so when, once as a coach, once you know who you're dealing with, <laughs> you know how to, how to proceed there. Yes. And you mentioned, you know, Tony Robbins and a lot of those other self-help gurus, so to speak. I mean, I listen to a lot of them just because for me, it helps with the motivation, right? They just spark some fire in me to keep going. And I know besides being a fitness and and health person you also you do so many different things right carolyn and i i learned recently that you also authored books and i think you just recently relaunched your book called wealth affirmations for abundance right and i wanted to talk about that a little can you share with us like what wealth stands for because you use that for different acronyms and maybe help define each of these different areas absolutely in order to understand why i do so many different things You'd have to understand at my heart, I'm an artist. 
I went to school to be an artist initially, um, but that is way too isolated of a trade for me mm-hmm. to be in. Knowing myself, I always have to be creating something. So if I'm not going to make art, I'm not painting. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a book. I'm yeah, going to make okay. dinner. I'm now gonna, it I'm, makes sense. That is just who I am. That's just how I'm built. And so um, the wealth book actually came out of the time where I was transitioning from Arizona to New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I mentioned briefly earlier that I was getting a divorce. So my kids and I moved to New Hampshire and, you know, we left a very beautiful home, a couple Mm -hmm. cars, the timeshares, you know what I mean? My business, like we left a very comfortable life Mm -hmm. and showed up in New Hampshire with the cat a car that my ex-husband was going to come and get in six months. And I had to like $432. Oh my God. Big change. It was a period of rebirth and starting over. Mm -hmm. And in order to manage my own thoughts and my own emotions, I started to utilize affirmations. Yes. great. And I would go for really long walks. (laughs) I would say things to myself. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I would say them out loud. The thing of it was, was that it was a period of time where I learned very, very firsthand the power of intention and the power of affirmation and the power of conscious language choices. Yes. Yes. So conscious language choices are a big thing. I talk with my clients about this all the time. So in the book that I wrote, which really, really came as a result of my own healing experience. Mm -hmm. Um, the wealth is an acronym, wellness, emotions, assets, leadership, time, and happiness. Mm-hmm. Great ones. And so these, I really felt were the main areas of people's lives where, or at least in mine, where I was struggling to maintain positivity. How could I change my own language choices in order to support that? Mm-hmm. But also, how could I help my clients to do the same? In chapter one, the wellness chapter, basically like the wellness chapter is all about becoming healthy, becoming whole, becoming energized via nutrition and fitness. Yeah, so important. I feel like I had that dialed in at that point to to a deep extent. But I was listening to my clients all the time saying negative things. And so I realized that if I could come up with some alternatives (laughs) to the things that they were saying, like, you know, that broken record that you play in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all have choices. We all want to feel good. We all deserve to feel good. So true. The first chapter is all about um, wellness insofar as what do I need to believe? What do I, what should I be saying to myself in order to foster greater health. The second chapter, emotions, basically, how can I become less judgmental in my relationships? Mm. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. That's really hard. (laughs) Yes, it is. I mean, and start to finish my relationship with myself to relationships with people I don't even know. How can I strengthen my current relationships? How can I let go of being like feeling like I have to be in control all the time? Mm -hmm. There are several affirmations in this chapter that are there to not only perhaps create a deeper sense of intimacy with others, Mm -hmm. but also allowing people to feel that their vulnerability makes them beautiful. Yes. Yes. We don't have to be strong all the time. So that's a great one. And then chapter three, you know, assets, it's like most people want more and whether that is more stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. A lot of people do. (laughs) Uh-huh. Or, or more happiness. Most people want more of what they feel like if they're lacking. So this chapter I wrote, not so much as far as like, oh, well, here's some stock market advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but more so like, if I want to manifest greater abundance mm-hmm. in any area of my life, what do I need to be focusing on? So it's not so much about money and it's not so much about the stuff. But it is about the fact that anything is possible, celebrating accomplishments and being grateful. And I do ask the question in there, like, am I afraid of success? 
Some people are it's surprising. I've never heard that question before when I was younger, but as I'm getting more into this industry and listening to others, there are people who are afraid of success. That's so true. And it's a great conversation to have with yourself, you know, yeah. <laughs> that is where people self-sabotage the most. Mm -hmm. You know what you need to do to be successful and yeah. then you just don't do it. Yes. So anyhow, so chapter four is all about leadership. And when I say leadership, I don't mean like becoming the CEO of a corporation, mm -hmm. but how can you be more effective, more productive and creative, whether you're at work or at home, yes. you know, and I think that leadership is a quality. It's not a titled position. This chapter is all about how are you contributing? How are you feeling that you are contributing to the world? Yes. Great one. And that can be in your own home. It can be in your town. It can be on the city council. It can be in your church. Becoming a leader just basically means like you show up and you do what you say you're going to do. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> so true. You don't really need to get to a certain title, get to a certain position, right? You could be 10 years old and lead the family in something. <laughs> Absolutely. It doesn't really matter. Leadership is just, it, it is a quality. Yes. So chapter five is all about time. And there again, this comes from not only my own experience, but working with all my clients who typically do not make themselves a priority in their own schedule. No, nobody does. <laughs> well, not, <laughs> not enough, I would say. Not enough people. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So basically, like, so the time chapter is all about affirmations that allow you to feel like you have permission to make yourself a priority in your own life. Yes. To important. acknowledge your needs. And then the, the last chapter, uh, happiness. You know, I start this chapter with a quote. There's a French writer called, his name is Montaigne. And it's, I've lived through so many terrible things and most of them never happened. <laughs> that is so, so true. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. I have a family member at home who's like, every time I say something, oh, this looks dangerous. Oh, this and this can happen. I'm like, gosh, just focus on the positive. I'm enjoying flowers right now. Don't talk to me about the thorns. <laughs> <laughs> People create such unhappiness in their lives by future tripping, right? Like they, they yes. project into the future all of these scenarios that are never going to happen, but it creates stress and anxiety. And so, yes, like you're saying, like focusing on the positive and this chapter is a lot about practicing gratitude. I'm working on and, that myself. Yeah. And, and there again, it, it is a practice, you know? And so yeah. that's why I wrote this book is it's small. It's simple. It's just like, if you need a little boost in one area, at any given time. It's something that you can, you know, pull out and read something that might make a difference in your mindset. I know I'm a really practical person. When I first heard about affirmations, it didn't click with me what that means. So in case anybody out there listening there still kind of feels like they only have a vague idea about I'm not very sure. So the way I've learned, and you can correct me, right, for affirmation, it's just a set of words, like very positive and intentional words that you repeat to yourself on a regular basis in order to achieve specific goals. Is this what you would define it as? More or less, yes. A mantra is a set of words that you could repeat over and over and over. Mm -hmm. When I'm working with clients, when they're making their affirmations, because I don't just tell people what to do, <laughs> I have two rules. And the only two rules for affirmations are they have to be positive and in the present tense. Mm, yes, I've heard about that. It's important to have strictly positive words. And it's imperative that the sentence is structured in the present tense. So not like, oh, I'm going to do this, or one day this will happen. It has to be, I am losing weight right now. You're sweating through your workout and you're like, oh my God, I hate the treadmill. No. <laughs> <laughs> I am losing weight right now. <laughs> yes. The purpose of using present tense based on what I've read is really for your body and kind of your subconscious for it to register that it's happening right now. It's with you, you're doing it versus this is something in the far future that might happen one day or not at all. But really present tense is to kind of make it stick with you more. Is that correct? Absolutely. And what's so interesting about humans is that our brains really don't know the difference between now and then. Mm -hmm. Like our brains are only functioning in the here and now. 
when we specifically state something is happening in the here and now, our brain believes that, like our nervous system reacts to that. I was just on a road trip. So say you're in downtown Philly, you're in a really bad neighborhood. <laughs> you can do one of two things. You can start to say to yourself, oh my God, I'm going to get carjacked. Oh my God. Like all, you can say all of the things that are going to happen and your blood pressure is going to go up. Your breathing is going to go down. Yes. You're going to make bad decisions. Or you can say to yourself, there are good people wherever I am. I'm going to figure this out. There are people who can help. You know what I mean? When you say things that are positive and in the present tense, like even for the exercise thing, you know, not to be so dramatic. Like I said, you're sweating through your workout. Your body hurts. You mm -hmm. don't want to be there. You can do two things. <laughs> oh my God. I feel horrible. <laughs> exercise. <laughs> this, I hate this workout. Yes. <laughs> Or you can change that up and say, you know, give it a different dialogue. Like I'm losing weight right now. I'm becoming healthier right now. My heart loves this. You know what I mean? Like, yes, <laughs> I've, I've actually made those choices too. Cause I always, I used to tell myself to, oh my God, I hate exercising. It's not my mm -hmm. thing. It's painful. But when my muscles got sore, I always say now, this is great. I'm building new muscles. I'm getting, new yes. <laughs> mm hmm and I know you mentioned your children, your mother of young adult children, and also a life coach, right? So naturally, I'm sure some of the things that you're teaching your client will probably infiltrate the way you teach your children as well, especially raising them when they were younger, right? What has kind of seeped into from your professional life into your private life where your kids are like, oh my God, I've heard my mom say this a hundred times, but then eventually they adapted that and it really helped them become the person they are today. You know, that's such a funny question because anybody who has kids know that primarily your kids are tuning you out. Like, you <laughs> yes, I know, especially okay. when they become teenagers. It's like the peanuts, like the Charles Schultz, you know, cartoon strip, like, wah, 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 yeah. wah, wah. okay. So my kids mostly tuned me out. However, they have had to listen to my phone conversations with clients because I, I do everything virtually. Like mm -hmm. before the coronavirus, I was still working online. So this hasn't been a huge shift for me, but mm -hmm. so they've heard me say, the same adages over and over and over and over and over through the years. And then it's funny where they turn up, right? Like, so my son, I don't know how old he was, maybe he was 16 or 17 or something like this. He wrote me a Christmas card one year uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, he was thanking me for being a mom and taking care of him and teaching him specifically uh -huh. that how you do anything is how you do everything. <laughs> and this is what you say all the time, right? <laughs> That's so funny. But like, that is something that he heard and latched onto, right? Yes. So my son has kind of picked up on the more like practical generalizations like this, like how you do anything is how you do everything. This is true. People don't want to admit this, but it really is true. Mm -hmm. My daughter, on the other hand, has become this like very, very righteous, like human rights advocate. Oh, Interesting. And she feels very strongly and she is very, very verbal about human rights and equality mm -hmm. and being able to treat people fairly. Oh, I love that. Like, whereas my son remembers like certain things by heart, my daughter has kind of picked up this whole, you know, she has a very strong ethical mindset. And in fact, now that she's just entering college, She's really excited to take classes in speech and debate, economics. You know, she's very interested in socioeconomic injustices in this country because she hears me talk about it all the time. Ah, so yes, it really manifested kind of like in her subconscious. It became part of who she is. Because when I'm talking to clients about food and about how lucky they are to be able to have fresh food in the first place, whereas people live in food deserts, like in Detroit, you cannot walk to get fresh food anywhere in areas in Detroit. It's called a food desert. Oh, and I didn't know that. There are many places in this country, in the United States, where people are unable to access fresh food. They don't oh. have vehicles. They don't have money. They don't even have a store that they could walk to, to buy vegetables. When we were living in Flagstaff, we saw this all the time with people on the Navajo reservation. There is a huge socioeconomic discrepancy in this country as far as what people can access in order to create better health. Oh, that's very interesting how it kind of, you know, what they picked up along the way. 
well, for me, I think it's a little bit intentionally because I, I want to raise them in certain ways that I feel like what are lacking because if if they don't go to school, they either go to classes or they play video games or watch TV or on social media, <laughs> right? I, I wanted to create something more intentional where I try to encourage them to read growth and development books at a younger age because I didn't pick them up until my early 20s. And things that I've learned in my 20s, my 30s, I wish somebody would have taught me when I was a teenager or a young adult. And that's why I created this podcast, right? But really setting some intentions and bringing it to their attention that such things exist or they should read about this or learn about this, or at least some exposure and at least they can choose for themselves after a while what they're more interested in learning, but at least they're aware this exists. So that's really important to me. Absolutely. And, you know, it's on that same vein, you know, I did the same thing with my kids Mm -hmm. slightly differently. I would just tell them what I was reading. Like not the whole thing, but I would pick one thing. And then over dinner or at some point, I would say, you know what? Gosh, I can't believe it. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And just try to engage them. I tried to get my kids to learn the art of critical thinking. Mm, Yes, that's an art. It's really true. That is not taught in our schools. Yes. (laughs) But that is how, in my opinion, you are able to succeed in life. You have critical thinking skills. Mm Mm-hmm. So whenever my kids were arguing with me, this is another thing. They're like, mama, (laughs) you never let us win an argument ever. Well, duh. But now you know how to argue. Um, (laughs) That and sarcasm. Sarcasm is another art that I That's a great one. Yes, I love that one too. But as far as, you know, debating goes, when they wanted something Mm -hmm. and I did not think that it was a good idea or I didn't want them to do it, I didn't say no right up front, or at least I tried not to. I said, help me say yes. Oh, I like that one. It's not that you can't do it. However, help me to say yes to this one. And that would force them to come up with an argument. Yes. That that they thought would win. Right? Because I think they need that skill in life. They're going to encounter a lot of times when somebody's going to say no. So how can you prepare not to even give that person a chance to say no? You're exactly right. Prepare ahead of time. Yeah. Help them to say yes. You probably read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? Oh, and Stephen Covey. Just yes. unpack that from a box. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and one of his habits is win-win, right? Think win-win. And when my kids were younger, I read them the kids book of it called uh, Seven Habits of Happy Kids, which I we actually discussed in another episode. The book for kids is really just seven stories and each story is talking about one of the seven principles. And I really like the story that Sean Covey, which is Stephen Covey's son, used the example how this main character of a girl, she wanted a uh, vegetable garden, but her mom said no. So she had to write her mom a letter with the Mm -hmm. think win-win in mind of how to convince her, okay, I get the vegetable card and I will get do everything. And in return, you actually get fresh fruits and vegetables. So really mm-hmm. there's no way for her mother to say no, because <laughs> he's taking care of everything that was mother's concern and she's getting something positive out of it. So I thought that was a really mm-hmm. good way to kind of explain it to them on their terms so they will understand. Absolutely. <laughs> this is great that you're teaching them that. I completely agree with you that critical thinking, problem solving, all of those, what I call soft skills, but they're oh so important, but unfortunately not taught in school. Well, you know, they're not taught in school because it takes a long time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not a formula. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Everybody is different. And so it's, it's not something that is immediately replicatable. Mm-hmm. Good point. It takes a it takes a lot of work, and it takes one on one work, and that's not how our school systems are set up. So, yeah. in my opinion, like, well, this is what I've always said too: is like, the whole time my kids were in school, my job was not to help them with their homework. Mm-hmm. It was not to do the <laughs> science project. My whole job was to be their advocate. Yes, love that. That's so true. I said them that too. I'm like, I'm not here to be your best friend. I'm not doing this. You do this yourself, but I help you, right? If you need material, I'll go buy it because you don't know how to drive yet. Um, yeah. But at the end, it's your homework, not mine. <laughs> and, and also like the advocation process 
in the school, like with the teacher. My son is an auditory learner. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to read, you know, hence he doesn't like to write. Yeah. He learns by listening. And so when he was a little guy, he would sit like in kindergarten, first grade, he would sit and it would look like he wasn't doing anything, Mm. but he was listening. He would come home and he would be able to recite to me verbatim. Wow. What the book that they had read in third period. That's impressive. But that is not the dominant learning style. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah that's very true in schools is remember spit it out in a test and then move on yep, to it's, the next one. it's read it write it down read write read write those are the things that he can't do very well oh that's a good point and so I made a point of showing up at parent teacher conferences and at the beginning of the year to help explain mm-hmm. what may or may not happen in yes. the coming months yes. you you may not you may not think anything is happening but I can assure you <laughs> but as long as you're talking, something is happening. <laughs> and this is, I mean, my son went to school every day, even if he was sick. He knew that he couldn't miss a class because then he wouldn't learn. Oh, wow. That brought him some dedication too, because he knew himself. Because we talked about it. Wow. I like that. Buddy. Get- <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is, what do you think? You know, so being an advocate for your kids and, and helping them attain the, the educational there are special needs that everybody has. Mm-hmm. Everybody's different. Yes. Some people need more autonomy. Some people need more accountability. Some people need auditory. Some people need visual. Some people are just completely like kinesthetic. People learn differently. Yes. And that's to be expected and respected. You teach your kids. I think you taught them a lot of skills. And one of the skills is probably to be adaptive because of moving around all these times, right? Just like you reinvent yourself all the time and create something new and pivot um, throughout your life. I'm sure your kids have learned that too. And I know you told me that for 2021, you're working on something new. Is this something that you're ready to share a little bit with our listeners just in case they want to hear more about it or is it still secret until it's completely done? (laughs) Well, is anything completely done ever? So <laughs> <Good point. laughs> I just recently moved from California to, back to the East Coast. So now I'm in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And I, I came here because specifically I was working with a nonprofit organization. There were plans. There were agreements. I moved across the country. And then life changed. Yes. And so I have had to, once again, really take stock in who I am. Mm-hmm. What is important? What do I love to do? Like what makes the time just fly by, right? And that is one-on-one coaching. And so basically I have relaunched a one-on-one coaching program. I'm calling it the, your new normal. All of our lives have been changed so significantly in this past year. Yes. In this past, mm-hmm. yeah. And so many of us have ended up having to, being forced to adapt to a new normal. Right. Yes, yes. And so it wasn't by choice. However, within any change process, there is room for growth and yeah, there's room absolutely. for expansion. Yes. And so I created this program, The New Normal, because I was seeing such great results with one of my clients with this everyday accountability texting thing. He had a very specific goal and he needed to change habits to get there. That's what working with a coach does. Mm-hmm. If you have a very specific goal, And you need to do very specific things on a daily basis to get there. The one thing that you need more than anything is accountability. Like Tom Brady did not become Tom Brady all on his own. He had coaches. (laughs) Plenty, more than one, I'm sure. (laughs) Exactly. Any athlete will tell you that they achieved their success because of their coaches. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to achieve anything or enhance their natural abilities Need some sort of coach, mentor. I'm launching a new program called The New Normal. You can start out with a 21-day only commitment, but there's also a 90-day program as well. It's working with me one-on-one to have the conversations like you and I have had in the past. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where I listen to you, you tell me the things, and then we come up with a plan. Yeah. You implement the plan. I give you resources. And then you are accountable to tell me what happened the next week. Then we brainstorm together. At the end of the day, you are doing the work. 
However, you have to have somebody on your team. So like when you start a business, you know, you need a business coach, you need an accountant, you need people on your team because you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. I agree. You can't do all of your social media and your accounting and your marketing and be who you are, which is the light of your business. Yeah. Whether or not you're starting a business or not, it doesn't matter. It's you want to create a change in your life. You need someone to be able to hold you accountable for a specific amount of time until the actions that it takes are the actions that feel normal. Yeah, I like that. No, I think it's really important that you bring that up to connect change with a life coach. Because I think that's the, probably the time when you could use one the most, right? Because mm-hmm. change is hard. Most people want to run away from change. Not too many embrace it. But in order to grow, to reach the next level of who you could become, you really need to make that change. Otherwise, it's going to be the same over and over. And like <laughs> one year pass and you look back, you're like, oh, I'm still the same person. Or oh, five it's, years pass. I'm still it's the Groundhog's same Day. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So definitely somebody to push you a little bit, get you out of the comfort zone more because that's the only way to grow. This is a great way to wrap all of that up. Mm -hmm. is exactly what you just said, is that people don't want to change. They're afraid of change, but but you're forced to experience change. Yeah. And so this is the thing. In life, the only thing that is constant is change. Nothing in this universe is static. Yes. However, the number one driving factor within human beings is to feel safe. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? So we want to know for sure that there's a roof over our heads, that we have a job, that we have money, that we have resources. We want to feel safe in our relationships. We want to feel safe. But then there's change. (laughs) What humans want is the exact opposite of what we get. Yeah. But we need it. (laughs) We so need it. And we can't get away from it. Like it, it is inevitable. So how do you deal in your mind with change? Yeah. No, I love that. So I guess the lesson of today, if you want to wrap it up, is really embrace change if you can as one of the big goals in life, because that would just help you (laughs) to move forward. Frame the words in your head in a positive and present tense. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I love that. You, You have given us really great little nuggets to really think about, right? What we could work on, what skill sets to develop for our younger audience over the years to just think about a little bit and really look into further. Now, I'm sure you have lots of good information. Is there a particular way for our listeners to follow you or to find out more information about you? My website is just simply my name. It's www.carolynmall.com. I'm on all the major social medias. So you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Insta. You can find me on LinkedIn. I don't do Twitter really. I'll be honest. Neither actually. (laughs) Too many to learn. (laughs) Well, there's just not enough room. I have lots of words. (laughs) But otherwise, really just reach out to me via email. So just carolyn at carolynmall.com. It comes right to me. And Mm -hmm. if you have a question about life coaching in general, if you have a question about if it might be a good fit for you and I to work together, just send me an email. Tell me a little bit about what's going on, a good way to reach you. And once again, it's just carolyn at carolynmall.com. I promise I will get back to you within 48 business hours and we'll go from there. Yes, thank you so much, Carolyn. I really appreciated your time and you coming in and sharing really great advice with our audience. And I know you have plenty of unpacking and what have you to do, right? <laughs> yes, you're the person who continually changes, right? You really exhibit that in, in your personal life and what have you. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Vanessa, for having me on and giving me the opportunity to, to hopefully change someone's opinion on yes. one thing in a positive way today. Yeah, so. thank you. Have thank a great you. day. You too. Thank you. Were you able to feel the positive energy that Carolyn Mall displayed throughout our entire conversation? And didn't she have a great view to share about how the words we speak to ourselves really matter? My question to you is, how will you incorporate affirmations into your daily lives? For this episode, this is my challenge to our listeners, you, to write down two affirmations that you will repeat to yourselves every day. And remember, they have to be written in a positive way and in present tense. And I would love for you to share what you have incorporated with the hashtag FirstMentorStreet on Instagram.
Thanks so much again for spending time with us, and we'll speak to you in the next episode. Have an amazing day. 